Um, I will just tell you briefly about the book, and I hope that I can talk more uh, during the Q&A. So um, the intellectual roots of this book go back to um, the early 90s. Um, I, yeah, I don't need that right now, thank you. Uh, when I started working on um, US empire studies, uh, which culminated in my book on uh, US Orientalisms, which I published in 1998, and also my interest in Asian American studies, which uh, for me has always been transnational. So um, then in 2001, and actually even more in 2003, um, the uh, with the invasion of uh, Iraq, it seems like U.S. imperial politics just unfolded in a real dramatic fashion um, before our eyes. And as a post-colonialist and as an Americanist, I was just fascinated, as were many, uh, by that script, which was massive violence followed by an immediate sort of pedagogy of recovery. And education seemed to be central there. And um, I remember uh, reading about George Bush's um, weekly address to the nation where he talked about how um, Iraq schools had crumbled under Saddam Hussein um, and he prioritized the building of schools through which uh, the US could kind of uh, help re uh, Iraq reclaim its proud heritage, et cetera, et cetera. And this idea of um, rebuilding and helping Iraq through education was endorsed by intellectuals on the right and intellectuals on the left. And this was like a deja vu moment because I knew some of the work that had been done on uh, US colonialism and education in the Philippines. And I knew some writers that I had been uh, reading like Carlos Bulosan and R. Zamora Lenmark, Santos, who had been registering some um, ideas about American education in their uh, fictional work. So I got interested in this cultural history of weaponized education, and I wanted to see how this was used at different sites of um, US empire. Uh, and in order to study the uh, continuities and discontinuities of this history, um, I chose to compare this project of what I think is weaponized education uh, in the Philippines with a completely different site and historical period. So instead of, say, looking at Puerto Rico in 1898, I went to the period of occupation in Japan by the Allied powers. It was an Allied occupation, but as you know, most historians uh, agree, uh, it was really a US occupation. And what I found was that in some ways, there was a remarkably similar kind of agenda um, spelled out in, in different documents and their reports of you know, the, the US uh, education mission to Japan. And um, they uh, stress, uh, what you could see over here was the ubiquity of this education as a, an arm of empire from this formal colonialism in the Philippines to um, the occupation in Japan. Um, and then interestingly, there were some of the same historical actors. You know, Douglas MacArthur's father was Arthur MacArthur, who had been the governor general of the Philippines. Um, Douglas MacArthur, who had uh, served in the Philippines and who really romanticized American um, education of the Philippines. Um, Curiously enough, um, there was a New York Times article of 2002 uh, with the headline, uh, the US has a plan to occupy Iraq, which informed readers that the Bush administration was developing a plan for post-war Iraq, which was modeled on the post-war occupation of Japan. This is 2002. So it was really interesting um, that this was being anticipated and that this memory was being marshaled for a foreseeable occupation in the future. Um, and then when Bush visited the Philippines in 2003, a few months after the invasion, which was, I think, March 2003, um, he spoke to the Philippine Congress and he said that the Spanish-American War uh, should be recalled as a model 
for the post-war rebuilding of Iraq. Um, and Amy Kaplan, who passed away recently, had written this um, article in the LA Times, I think, um, and she called it the confusion of occupation with liberation. So if education was such a central part of empire, I wanted to see how educators perceive Japanese and Filipinos and what kinds of subjects people they wanted to produce, how uh, they racialized these two Asian people and what kind of new Filipinos or Japanese they imagined themselves facilitating, right? Um, at the same time, I did not want to privilege only the colonial perspective because um, colonialism, no matter how uh, violent has um, or unequal, has to be in a sense collaborative, even in the most unequal of, of conditions. I don't mean equal partnership. I just mean that there has to be some degree of collaboration. And that also colonial ideologies are uh, always resisted, appropriated, adapted, got tested, although in very different kinds of ways. So I wanted to have a methodology that was both comparative in the examination of the imperial educational archives, and I wanted to look at native texts ranging from, you know, uh, I'm a literature professor, so obviously novels, short stories, um, autobiographies, but also films, um, textbooks, um, as well as some interviews that I did. And what I found um, in the archive was that uh, Filipinos, even though they were seen through the lens, um, they were often seen through the lens of domestic racial categories, and they had to be, and they were seen as people to be culturally uplifted while uh, the Japanese were seen as foreign and had an excess of culture. Uh, could I have slide number three from the PowerPoint, please? Uh, the next, yes, this one, thank you. So, um, no, uh, the previous one, please. The, the previous one. Okay, thank you, yeah. So, uh, all right, uh, I guess we're having difficulties with that. But um, if you happen to see that that third one, um, the, the one with um, Almira, if you can show me the, uh, yes, that one, just keep it there uh, and then I'll tell you when to move on, thank you. Okay, so here you see this cartoon. It was published in uh, the Journal of Detroit in February, 1899, and it was titled The White Man's Burden. Uh, it's flipped, I'm sorry, the schoolhouse, <laughs> the image got flipped. Uh, and you see this tall um, American soldier, he has a rifle um, and he's carrying this unwilling uh, Filipino. He's trampling on this bloody past and he's looking to uh, a future. And the soldier and Filipino um, are contrasted. Um, the um, a Filipino has his back towards the school while the soldier is facing up to the task to tutor the native. And the Filipino is represented through um, some domestic racial categories, uh, signifiers of Indianness, wearing you know feathers and a headdress, but he's also caricatured, possibly as African American. A lot of people have argued that that uh, in the early representations of of Filipinos, those were the comparative racial categories. But um, the point is that he's he's being taken to be uplifted and civilized. Uh, could you move to the next one, please? Uh, the next image, uh, Almira. Thank you. Um, so this this next one, um, this was published in 1945 in the Pittsburgh Post. And this also dramatizes forcible schooling. So the classroom has been taken away, taken over by the Americans and an American officer, uh, presumably MacArthur striding into the classroom and his movement of his body is very determined, probably like the other uh, soldier you saw earlier. But instead of carrying the white man's burden, he's going to disabuse the Japanese children uh, of any ideas of Japanese power and pride. Uh, the children are shocked uh, for the lesson that is presented to them, which is Japan lost the war. And the classroom is a metonym for the uh, nation. So what these children need is, um, you know, they're in the classroom. What they need is re-education. Um, and so um, 
although there were many changes in the way educators saw these people, I'm, I'm just kind of uh, summarizing ma major trends. Uh, Filipinos might not have been seen necessarily as savage, but as people who needed to be um, uplifted uh, and deemed fit for industrial education. Um, it was sort of like the, um, uh, they were seen as tropicalist um, oriental people, th that tropicalist was often a term to be used for them. Um, you know, often they were lazy, uh, indolent, nature supplied them with everything. So why did they have to um, do much? Um, and of course this, this varied according to different classes as well. Um, but they needed to be uh, enculturated into a culture of um, uh, democracy and uh, liberty and so on. Um, but if Filipinos uh, lacked culture, uh, the Japanese are seen to have an excess of culture, right? Uh, so the idea was that the Filipinos needed to be educated while the Japanese needed to be re-educated and decultured. And re-education was an official term that, that was used. Um, so interestingly, um, to me, a very telling example of this was how language got racialized. So when educators in the Philippines had to explain to American policymakers, for example, uh, and this was in 1902, uh, why English was being instituted, um, Barrows, who was a secretary of education, um, argued that, uh, sorry, a director of education argued that unlike English, which had grown by absorbing other languages, it was a resilient language, it was the language of the Anglo Saxon. Tagalog, for instance, was not strong enough. It did not have the capacity for growth. It couldn't intermingle with other languages and so on. And his ideas about the language was similar to some of the ideas he had expressed about the people. So the language itself gets racialized, right? Tagalog was not a language that was resilient enough to enter modernity. Um, you can take away that image if you want, uh, Amira. Uh, thank you. Uh, so um, in Japan, the educators um, engaged in a similar thing, not to have English as much, but to change the script change the script from Japanese to Romaji. And, but when they did that, they didn't talk about the backwardness of the language, but rather the dangerous faculty of memorization that was required by the script. And that had led to um, you know, a, a, a very um, problematic and imperial mindset, right? So it wasn't backwardness as much as uh, the danger of this this language, um, and then when I um, the other part was when I looked at some native texts which were kind of registering this this uh, education. Many of them did. I saw that many of ideas of uh, American pedagogy were destabilized at the same time as many of these uh, natives found American rhetoric of liberating people through democracy and freedom and all useful. And one of the most fascinating um, number of texts here was uh, the OCS readers, readers um, that were meant to teach students English uh, in the Philippines. Uh, they were authored by Camillo Osius. This is the first Filipino superintendent of schools. They were published in the 1920s. And we look closely at these readers and see how he actually uses the whole rhetoric of freedom, liberation, uh, liberation and democracy to at once echo American justification for colonization and to advocate for Filipino nationalism. And so the, the kind of liberatory potential of democratic values becomes a way of critiquing hegemony from within the educational system of which, you know, he's a part, he's participating in it, critiquing it, from within, right? Um, or if you look at completely different texts, like um, you know the short story by a Nobuo um, called *The American School*, or uh, Shinoda in his um, film uh, *MacArthur's Children*, um, they are dealing with the American influence through um, the idea of a different kind of um, masculinity or maleness for post for Japan. Uh, and they turn to things like passive resistance and mourning. So um, it, 
there's there's both a um, acknowledgement and usefulness of aspects of this pedagogy, but also a real resistance. And there's so there's a tension between these ideal subjects that Americans hope to produce uh, through their colonial pedagogy in the official documents and the resistance and the uneven materialization of this pedagogy in these um, native texts. Um, and then, of course, um, I don't want to completely you know, valorize these native texts because when they are engaged in the process of nation making, um, they have their own uh, indigenous populations um, that, that often are, are excluded uh, and so on, and the constructions of you know, homogeneous nation. Um, but I'm going to stop here, um, just hope I briefly explained what I tried to do in the book. And, uh, I can take questions from um, people. I hope I didn't go over 10 minutes. I was given 10 minutes. That's all right. Thank you. Thank you, Malini. Um, and so uh, listening to the overview, your overview of, of what you did in the book, um, I think it gives us some um, understanding of the, the title. And, and, and that's what I'd like to begin with, um, the title you chose for the book, Campaigns of Knowledge. And, and although you had given some um, um, details about the methodology and the, the data which you examined in the book, I'd, I'd like to focus the discussion with Elena and, and Marby, beginning with the title and the key concepts of campaigns. Um, what campaign was this? Um, what knowledge and, and for what purpose uh, were these campaigns of knowledge driven? Okay, so I, I use the term campaign precisely because of its militarist uh, mm. tone, right? There were different kind of military campaign, and this was a militaristic campaign, mm. right? And so um, people acknowledge that, um, you know, the the uh, one of the very famous memoirs by Mary Helen Fee, Woman's Impression of the Philippines, talks about how this army of educators. Um, you know, uh, came to the Philippines and they were the most earnest army. And a lot of people use that term, the army of educators. Um, mm -hmm. I think quite unironically, um, mm -hmm. acknowledging that this was part of the, the military's effort, but also remember the very, you know, you, you, you guys know the history better than I do. Um, you know, the very first schools were open in the Philippines, like just a couple of months after uh, Dewey's, um, you know, the uh, invasion uh, in Corregidor by American soldiers. And uh, when um, Arthur MacArthur asked for funds for education, uh, he clearly spelled out that this was an adjunct to military operations. Over and over again, um, this was part of pacification. So campaign, this, this, this was a campaign. It was an educational campaign. It was a campaign. So I wanted to evoke that sense of the um, militaristic nature of this weaponized education, right? Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't matter that it had different consequences that, um, you know, the people who participated in it might have had all kind of selfless interests, but they all knew. I mean, they, they went on uh, U.S. ship as part of the U.S. effort. They all knew that. Right. And they're representing um, uh, the U.S. at a time when there's an insurrection. They, they you know, they were not unaware of that mm -hmm. um, just because people are unaware of it now. Uh, they were not unaware of it. then. so these, these were campaigns. So, you know, that's one part of it. And then um, knowledge is, you know, I, I think in any colonial project, um, I mean, it's not only an occupation of, as you know, Bernard Cohen, famous uh, scholar who I really uh, admire, explained, uh, colonization is not just about physical space, it's always about epistemological space, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And of course, this takes place differently in different, uh, you know, kinds of uh, in venues. But I mean, the Philippines particularly, um, what was so interesting was just the speed, you know, mm -hmm. immediately you're there, Two months later, you establish schools. Uh, two years later, you send 1,500 teachers. Um, and, and this is why, uh, I mean, I, I was more fascinated with that than with you know, a place like Puerto Rico, where they only sent a few hundred people there. Um, they only sent like you know, barely 20, 30 people to Cuba. 
Um, mm. But I think the reason that they they sent this many and this was talked about was because there was such a strong resistance. There was a strong insurgency, right? Mm. And so these people came and they were seen as doing the job that the military campaigns, you know, were uh, could not do in the sphere of um, making America seem benevolent to the native. I mean, mm -hmm. they could not be seen as benevolent when you know there's been that that kind of violence. So yeah. um, mm -hmm. th this kind of epistemological now you can call it violence, you can call it something else, and I'm you know happy to go into all the contradictions and complexities mm -hmm. um, of that. Um, Sorry, so I got so excited, I forgot the other question <laughs> was. Um, and, and for what purpose? For I, I suppose, I think you're answering all, all, all those questions. Uh, for what purpose were the campaigns of knowledge driven? driven right. By so, of okay, so uh, if, if you take both the sides, I mean, so there's the, the, the political purpose of pacification. I think I think that was really uh, uh, important because if you if I look at you know um, early accounts of uh, teachers who are writing from different provinces, <clears throat> so early on they're writing that for instance we're not very welcome you know uh, people are resisting they're not coming to school what should you do uh, well we can impose fines on them um, if their parents if they don't send them to school and so on uh, then but then they start to see that um, you know that in a few years and then in, in one of the reports it's actually uh, one of the um, deputy superintendents of education says i'm not surprised people are coming because it's mandatory. They they have to. They've been told they'll be fined. They'll be imprisoned. You know, mm -hmm. so there's a there, there's this mixture. I mean, there's definitely coercion. There's no doubt about that. When you read the educational reports, there is coercion. You know, mm -hmm. no matter how much you want to romanticize it, there's coercion there. Yeah. Um, but once it takes place, people also see chances of mobility or whatever, you know, and they go forward. So w the political task one is pacification. The other thing is to uh, I see a major thing was to really get people to appreciate things like individualism, industry, uh, democracy, those kind of values, self-rule, but not not too much, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you have um, these, you know, individualism, democracy, and so on, to a certain extent, but not to the point where, and also to the exclusion of, and what was seen as anathema both in, in Japan and the Philippines was family-oriented community values. Right. Right. And so those were to be, um, to, to, to um, be, uh, you know, sort of questioned in many ways, like, you know, you, you do your thing, kind, um, you know, that, that was the idea in many of the, you know, school exercises and all is how to exercise your opinion. Um, mm -hmm. Because it was the values of, you know, community that would actually be more useful in mm -hmm. contesting American rule, for instance, right? Community and solidarity. So those, those are not really encouraged. Um, then you had, you know, um, ideas of self-help and so on which it was argued was you know you know americans are there to liberate you to to give you democracy and so on mm -hmm. and so in japan it was a situation as they called it the contradiction of democracy from above right mm -hmm. uh, and john dower has written so eloquently about it i i don't think i can add a whole lot um to that um or in the philippines the idea that yes eventually they were going to be given you know self rule but but not right now so mm -hmm. you know ideas like you know to to have um, people in a sense uh, in both the cases to see that their own uh, liberation was congruent with american colonialism mm -hmm. in one case and mm -hmm. occupation with the other it's really bizarre and it's so interesting uh, mm -hmm. elena you have a question uh, thank you so much. This is just a, a, a fascinating. Uh, it's fascinating to listen to you, and I just I love the book so much. I thank have, you. I have a question. You have so much, so thank you. Your um your book inspired me to think about um an argument about gender that you raise, and your visual images just scream with the patriarchal authority 
of a certain type of militaristic uh, institutionalization of of uh, education, re-education. The image of General MacArthur with the pipe in his mouth is all over your yeah. book's imagery. But I was thinking about if you could say just a little bit, especially for those of us who study uh, gender studies, can you talk about the gendered logic of campaigns of knowledge in between images of, um, especially with the Philippines, all these patriarchal images and even the images of natives who are being educated are male natives. We can talk about the really racist depiction as well. But with your Japanese case studies, uh, both in the Japanese War Bride School, the, the, Red, the American Red Cross, and in your literary examples, you talk about how uh, Japan or nation is embodied by woman. And so I'm interested in the, the, the ways in which your book lays out a fascinating gendered argument between uh, militarized masculinity, um, tutelage, authority, and then, uh, and then the gendered subjects of those in the classroom. Your book concludes with those, you know, those um, bright-eyed, newlywed Japanese brides in the classroom going through the, with a pretty tame uh, curriculum, right? But I'm fascinated with this, the gender politics that your book lays out. If you could say a few things. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's all over. And uh, I wish I could say that a completely new uh, gendered orientation, you know, uh, politics uh, played out. I mean, in, in some sense, it's always new, depending on the situation. But um, I'm not the first one to, to argue or to um, say that that uh, colonialism, imperialism are profoundly gendered, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, if we uh, look at, um, you know, uh, the idea, I mean, <clears throat> one can, um, you know, just, I mean, there's so many different um, instances, but when um, Roosevelt, Theodore Roosevelt is arguing for, um, you know, the strenuous life about, um, you know, going, going and, you know, men from um, uh, America who need the strenuous life and who shouldn't be indolence. And, you know, this, this bourgeois life has really made them so effeminate. If they went out to the colonies, they would regain their manly vigor. I mean, mm. it's screaming at you that mm. that what is happening, um, you know, in terms of this education is this idea of this, um, you know, militarized masculinity and weaponized mm. education. Now, it's interesting that, you know, as far as education is concerned, in the classroom, Okay, I mean, it's the soldier. Both my images were of of, of men, and that, those were not the only images. Um, they were, you know, images because what they try to do, in fact, um, and this is something I discussed briefly. In, I I do discuss in the book, but I don't use that image. Um, and I I guess I can't, you know, pull up another one right now to show you. But um, if I could have uh, my Google, I could show you. But uh, anyway, um, Americans actually even though in the beginning, uh, the Thomasites, Thomasites were people for the audience who don't know, uh, people who came on the transport USS Thomas uh, to the Philippines in 1901 to, uh, you know, thousand, you know, what, seven, 800 came and then, you know, another, so they were like 1500, they were called Thomasites. Uh, most of them were men. But even from the beginning, the Americans tried to present um, educating the Philippines, not as what was done by these uh, soldiers with their weapons. They started the first school. Now it was the school teacher with the book. So um, there was an attempt to present this education as uh, the gentler, uh, kinder, gentler, <laughs> uh, feminized side, which is why you see in the later, um, you know, um, short stories, these people like Tiempo's, um, Edith Tiempo and, and Correa, who deal with educators, male educators, the kind of anxieties they have, if, you know, because teaching is seen as this, this feminized kind of task. So that's yeah. one part of it. But there's so much gendered politics because when they talk about, say, Filipino teachers, they're not seen, uh, male teachers I'm talking about, they're not mm -hmm. seen as having the same kind of qualities as mm -hmm. the American male teachers, for mm -hmm. instance. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, uh, Japanese men, I mean, there's endless, uh, you know, um, depictions of them and, and educators writing about them as, uh, you know, they were so, it's, but Japan is so schizophrenic. On the one hand, Japanese men and some Japanese women are 
superhuman, militaristic, evil, powerful people. On the other hand, they're not really manly because they lack the manly qualities of mm. honesty, uh, character, solidity. Mm. They're devious, mm. they're cunning, mm. you know. And so mm. there's a different kind of masculinity that gets, a, uh, you know, inscribed onto them, mm. which is not sort of the wholesome, um, mm. you know, Western masculinity. But your gender is such a central component of, uh, of the book, I mean, there, there's no doubt about it, and that's why when you know, when you know, uh, I think when um, novelists and short story writers are dealing with this, you, they can't help but sort of play with the gender politics in order to critique the, uh, you know, the sort of heteronormative, powerful masculinity that's being articulated in these these imperial construction. And you know, I mean, the, you mentioned the Japanese. Um, brides you know i mean this so one way of showing how these brides had um or were going to improve or japanese women had improved you know they were they were rescued from their centuries of subservience and all that mm -hmm. and the height of their improvement was what photographs that showed them on the arms of white men you know mm -hmm. that was a liberated woman so mm -hmm. if if the woman could align herself with this wholesome masculinity she by osmosis would become mm -hmm. more liberated but mm -hmm. yeah i mean thank you elena i mean that i think gender is such an um, you know integral part of this this whole enterprise of, of education there's no doubt about it um mm -hmm. i mean even the even, even language even the language is gender even mm -hmm. arguments mm -hmm. about language are gender mm -hmm. that's just so interesting yeah. Marbi, would, would you like? Is there, is there a comment or, or some? Um... No, I just like. I mean, something was running through my mind, and mm -hmm. it's just that the colonial enterprise really mm -hmm. is all about emasculating the colonists, right? Right. right. So yeah. um, that's just one thing that was uh, going through my mind while while uh, Elena and Malini were discussing this. Okay, uh, on 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 page four. So going to the, you've you've mentioned Malini um, many of the documents and the the narrative texts that you've explored um, for your book. So on page four in the introduction, you explained that your book uses a contrapuntal method, examining educational documents of the colonial and the occupation archive and putting them in conversation with native cultural texts that register the subject uh, subjectification. So. Um, I'm, I'm interested to find out what you found. I'm sure you you scoured through voluminous texts and and um, and the and the documents. But what did you find striking among the education documents you studied in relation to these native cultural texts? Perhaps you can cite um, um, one or two uh, striking elements from those from those archives. Um, okay. Um... So I guess the most striking things in some of those archives, and I and I, I saw that through both, um, um, say, uh, reports that I found in you, know, like the um, in the Philippines there were annual reports from the directors of education, mm -hmm. you know, that mm -hmm. talked about, and that those often included then reports from the directors of different provinces and so on. So one of the striking things um, that that I found was that um, you had ideas about some uh, Filipinos who uh, ideas about them not being able to. Uh, really learn, um, mm -hmm. and that um, you know, they, they, you know, they they were more prone to memorization. Um, and I mentioned this because this was also interesting as far as the um, uh, Japanese were concerned. Uh, they're prone to memorization. They don't have any ideas of their own. Um, and then on the other hand, and this this is uh, something that you know, uh, different educators mentioned. Like one of the educators talks about. Uh, yes, so now you know my students are really good in math in in, uh, in mathematics. They were quite clever. They were almost better than American students. But of course, we must remember the general character. So the general character was that they they can't really learn. They can't really be creative. They can just imitate. Uh, they have no ideas of their own. And then um, you know someone like Mary Helen Fee who. Uh, 
talks um, and she she's mentioned a lot because her memoir became like you know a, a bestseller it had went through two editions uh, it's been one of the most widely uh, cited memoirs so she also mentioned you know they have they have no originality they have no creativity and so on at the same time she's talking about how they don't listen to her mm. she tells them you shouldn't be so interested in you know the arts and all poetry and stuff like that this is not for you you should be interested in more practical and they say no 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 you don't understand mm. we are a very artistic people we are the most mm. poetic people we're not like you americans boring people we we're really and and she and she does not to shut them up um mm. but on the other hand she has to say because this is part of the rhetoric that they they can't be producers of knowledge mm. Mm. they cannot be producers of knowledge they have to learn from the american they they cannot think on their own they're not producers so mm. how can they imagine something different right mm. from what is being being fed to them so that that was one of the real striking things mm. um and then uh, you know the idea of um uh, another thing was that that struck me in many of these documents was the idea of uh, filipinos uh this is the upper class the elite who mm. had these cultures and manners that they had la- learned from the the evil spanish right mm. Uh, mm. hierarchical spanish uh they had polish and manner but this was just superficial uh this didn't indicate any depth of character um and so on and this this was recounted by a number of uh teachers including um you know somebody like uh William Freer who was another um you know school teacher um in in the Philippines mm-hmm. um and then you see um somebody like uh Carlos Bulosan and I know that his uh very famous um um memoir America uh, autobiography Americas in the heart mm-hmm. has been seen very much only as an immigrant uh text but it's not just an immigrant text because he was mm-hmm. from the philippines he's writing uh there um and he um sees this you know you you see sort of this uh, way in which he deals with this idea of superficial customs and manners by mm-hmm. creating um a school teacher who apes these manners mm-hmm. in the in but he's aping these manners he's aping americans mm-hmm. he's not aping filipino elite mm-hmm. right uh, he because bulosan um uh, specifically calls his manners he was aping these american things and he is the more uh, in in that sense that teacher is uh, crooked um he is corrupt and he the narrator is disgusted with him so it's interesting that this whole this uh, whole rhetoric of um you know the the filipinos having these superficial manners gets transposed by somebody mm-hmm. like bolo san onto the filipino who's imitating american manners and and i think this is a direct kind of contestation of of the general kind of representation which bolo san is i think is extremely aware of that because that novel is for me it's shot through with this whole critique of the educational enterprise it's not simply about the immigrant experience and his going to the you know to uh, to the us um uh, that way um no i forgot where the question started um the oh what did i find in those works yeah and then i i think to uh, go to um you know japan i think one of the you know very powerful works was um the film macarthur's children um where you have you know instances and this ties into elena's question about masculinity um because you have um you know um, a central character uh, who's a school teacher whose husband has um he's somewhere in the war they they think he might have died um he comes back with an amputated leg uh not impotent uh because he is that you know and the movie just screaming with these these images right so he's not impotent but he has a different kind of gendering right which is um not according to the american the the character who has been most influenced by the americans who parties with the americans and so on um and who can be seen sort of maybe 
a collaborator is, is uh, not the best word, but he's definitely one who celebrates um, you know, American soldiers coming in, they, they are in a separate room. And you see uh, American soldiers um, you know, taking over Japanese home. They've taken the home um, of this uh, school teacher. Her husband is missing, so she's with the in-laws, and the in-laws have a lot of pressure on her to marry the husband's younger brother, which she does not. But you see this uh, very powerful scene um, in which Shinoda juxtaposes and it goes back and forth. The Americans are, um, you know, um, heartily uh, eating and drinking. They have assimilated to Japanese ways. You know, they're you know eating you know, Japanese food, but they're drinking. They're loud. They're uproarious. The brother-in-law is there. He's welcoming the Japanese as guests. And then in the next room, he comes to the next room and rapes the school teacher which is sort of the rape of the nation through mm -hmm. this kind of aggressive masculinity, which is welcomed by the brother-in-law, uh, which again is, is the, I see as a reaction to a kind of critique of the kind of, um, you know, masculinity that the Americans, um, you know, tried to show was, um, you know, the, the, the valor I sought. So not the Japanese who were into ultranationalism, militarism, devious and so on, but these wholesome kind of characters. And this is, a, that movie was just like a total critique. So that, that's a couple of examples of these documents and texts speaking to each other. Right, right. Marbi, would you like to add to, um, from your, from your uh, research interests and your literary um, I actually have a question. Congratulations, Malini, for producing this book. Um, Thank which you. Looks at, Thank you. Which looks at you know the in depth, um, at, which looks in depth at the different technologies you now used mm -hmm. in the Philippines and Japan as part of the colonial enterprise, as well as mm -hmm. how um, these actually continue to impact contemporary Philippine systems and Philippine mm -hmm. literature. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm very interested in your analysis of Edith Tiempo's work, especially when. You know, you compare these two recent studies on Tiempo and the Suleiman University Writers Workshop, which she and her husband, Edilberto Tiempo, who uh, during that time was a CIA informant, no? um, they found them. So um, one of the works talking about this um, would be Conchitina Cruz's um, Miseducation of the Filipino Writers. Um, this is... Um, oh, you mean Constantino's essay? No, no, no. Sorry, no. Are you uh, Conchitina... Conchitina Cruz. Um, she's also um, a faculty member um, of the okay. of the English department in UP, as well as um, a poet. And um, she wrote an article entitled "The Miseducation of the Filipino Writer," wherein she talks about the Siliman University Workshop and the Tiempos, right? Um, and she links the Siliman University Workshop to the colonial enterprise through the propagation of new critical theory, which is devoid of engagement with historical and social realities, as well as the insistence on something like proper literary language that is based on American aesthetics, um, and accepting only submissions written in English as the basis for fellowship. So according to your analysis, um, Tiempo's work exhibit post-colonial anxieties. So do you think uh, this could be linked to um, the tensions you mentioned as being experienced by people who resist coloniality, but are also working within colonial institutions or founded on colonial I'd really love to hear more about these tensions, especially as in your book, you pose the question of, can nationalist decolonization projects be carried out within colonial institutions? Okay, did you want me to talk about uh, Tiempo or the uh, uh, question in uh, general? Uh, no, no, uh, a dog in the background. Sorry. No, no, not my dog. <laughs> I don't have a dog here oh. right now. <laughs> Is there a dog barking? It wasn't mine. <laughs> no, I no was dog here. disturbing today. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. So, uh, no, I was did just, you want um, me? Yeah, kind of, because um, in your book you also talked about. Um, how how decolonization projects, or you pose the question of how decolonization projects can be carried out within colonial institutions. So one of the, right. yeah. So 
um, Edith Tiempo founded together with her husband, founded Siliman. the Siliman, yeah, Siliman Writers Workshop, which um, produced writers, you know, with who are, you know, if we're talking about epistem epistemology, then the source of knowledge of these writers are colonial models, right? Or, um, mm -hmm. yeah, so um, maybe just, uh, I'd love to hear more about that, um, these tensions bet between, you know, um, people working within colonial institutions or um, or institutions that are founded on colonial models. Yeah, um, for sure. So, um, particularly with um, uh, you know Suleiman, I mean that's the workshop that is contrasted with the workshop in I think UP um, UP itself, right? University of Philippines, which is a um, lot less uh, Americanized in, in many ways. Uh, but um, th I think there's a lot of examples of that uh, working within colonial institutions. And I, I don't know if I can steer on an example. I, I can use an example from the book or even after the book, because I've been working on this some more, uh, this whole question some more. But with Tiempo, the stories that I looked at, maybe what you're saying is that that seems counterintuitive because Tiempo was so into new criticism and um, apolitical kind of um, analyses. But I, I sort of feel that somebody who, well, let me put it this way, um, things that are written in the 1950s in the Philippines um, with, um, you know, um, the 50-year-old American colonialism ending, and they're talking about education and teachers who are steeped in American values. There's no way that that can be separated from the colonial project, no matter how new critical Edith Tempo wanted to be. And obviously, if she was writing about these educators who, you know, are like reciting um, poetry, uh, that they have memorized from their their uh, you know Western masters, and she's opposing them to characters in those story who are more, shall we say, local, right? Uh, and who find these characters comical, and these characters themselves are anxious and um, uh, uh, you know upset. There's something going on in terms of the kind of disorder left by the colonial enterprise that even though tempo might be seen as apolitical i don't think these stories are so maybe i'm going completely against the grain of um, you know tempo scholarship but it just to me they just they just scream to me like that um can i use an, something from after and maybe i'd like your uh, input as well, working you know, through colonial structures. So uh, I mentioned this very briefly in, in the book, um, but I've, I've been working on it some more, was in 2001, there was this um, centennial uh, celebration of the Thomasites in the Philippines, right? And that was like, to me, really interesting. Like, why are these Thomasites being celebrated? What's happening? Um, you know, the, the, the kinds of uh, mixtures of um, critique uh, as well as praise for the trauma sites. Um, but what I, I've at least found till now in in looking at you know so many different things happened you know in that in that celebration, um, including uh, somebody from Talak Province, for example, who wrote this biography of Frank White. So I thought, well, let me take a look at this biography. But the biography of Frank White is, doesn't say much about Frank White. It's about, oh, Aguinaldo first, you know, wrote on the degrees of the people who got their, um, the, the, the people who got the degrees from Tarlag. Aguinaldo signed the, the, you know, their, their degrees and wasn't that great. And wasn't it great that uh, Bokobo was one of the graduates of Tarlag province and wasn't Tarlag province great in producing all these people? And so, yeah, I mean, he is writing a biography of Frank White who really was a, Put a nasty superintendent of education, a director of education. But at the same time, in the biography of Frank White, it was interesting to me that the biography isn't really 
an adulatory kind of biography, right? And so I, I do, I really think about, you know, James Scott's notion of hidden transcripts always. And it, it just comes out there. I mean, so much of that biography is not about the character. Uh, and I, do, I don't, I'm not going to go into any intentional fallacy, but you just see what's produced is the pride in that place. Dala Province High School produced all these students. So here's a good example of somebody who's not colonial, but sort of working within. I mean, this whole centennial thing was financed a lot by um, the US, um, 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 you know, um, diplomatic um, USIA office and all that. So it was a big thing of American diplomacy, right? And so you could see it as neo colonial. Uh, forgive my saying so, but um, at the same time, you see different kinds of things emerging. And I also had a really, um, I'm doing, working on a long um, uh, analysis of Tony Perez's uh, rewriting of Mary Helen Fee's A Woman's Impression of the Philippines. And uh, that is very fascinating. It's not published yet. I have to get in touch with Mr. Perez again, because I actually want to publish that thing. Um, but it, it's called 100 Songs of Mary Helen Fee. And he's again, you know, he had worked for the USIA. He's part of the structure. Um, and then he writes this, this drama, which is the celebration. Anyway, I'm going on and on. But <laughs> we have a, um, Manlini, we have a question from, from our listeners. Um, one from um, Mary Raselis. So, uh, hi, Doc Mary, who's listening to us right now. Um, Mary asks, when Judy Ick and I were compiling entries for bearers of benevolence. Uh, we looked for, but could not readily find commentaries by Filipinos critical of the educational system brought by the Thomasites, which you mentioned a while ago. So, so that's why we're asking this now. Conclu we concluded that researchers or Filipino researchers should go through the Tagalog Cebuano local commentaries. Is this an appropriate way of thinking about critiques? We should go through. Yeah, uh, I mean, I, I really appreciate Bearers of Benevolence, that, that book. Um, it was, uh, you know, really interesting. I'm very familiar with it. And thank you, uh, Professor Rasilis, for uh, uh, listening in. Um, I, I really appreciated the book. Um, yes, there's a, there's a lot of um, commentaries by uh, Filipinos who are very appreciative of the Thomasites. Um, None of those commentaries are from contemporary students writing at that same time. They're all, uh, some of them are written by Americans. A lot of them are written by Americans writing about the Thomasites. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, some of them are written many years later, looking back at the Thomasites, but they're not students mm -hmm. who are writing. I think some of those accounts of students, I think definitely, I mean, I was, at um and i acknowledge you know i i was looking at english language sources um you know that it's a limitation of my study i am not familiar with um um uh, you know the so many other languages definitely going to local sources would help a lot because you know in the first uh, few decades of of uh, uh, american in the first decade of american rule um and you probably know you know that more than i do uh, the most seditious work was being done in vernacular languages uh, creative mm -hmm. works dramas have been done in vernacular languages so mm -hmm. um those might be the places to uh, look at some of those, um, you know, some of those critiques. But in, in Bearers of Benevolence, I didn't find, I looked very hard to see were there any students at that time, because, you know, the, they're teaching the students English, right? Mm -hmm. So the students could write something in English if, if they were asked about, uh, about that. So the, then the other way, if you're looking at English sources, to extrapolate that is to look at accounts of the teachers. Um, and, and you see all kinds of things. I mean, you see accounts of teachers who are, uh, at least I saw a lot of accounts of teachers in the annual reports when they're writing back, when they're saying, you know, students are going on strike. Uh, this is in 1902, this is in 1910, this is in 1920. How to stop them? Why are they going on strike? What, what's their problem? So this is, they're not welcomed wholeheartedly. I mean, that is very clear in the archive. Um, 
what we don't have is very many of those voices. And I think Professor Rasulis and all acknowledge that in bearers of benevolence that they don't have those, those native voices. Mm -hmm. uh, which, yeah, those local sources, honestly, I think people who have the facility with the language, uh, and I, you know, that's, that's a shortcoming, but <laughs> I'm too old to learn a new language. Uh, you know, anything that's translated, whatever I, you know, go for the sources, but I, I, I acknowledge the, you know, the limitations of my study. Yeah. We have, we have another question from, from Roger Mawali. I, I hope I got that right. Um, um, he asks, could you talk about contemporary perceptions among Filipinos of this historical legacy? Okay, so, okay. Um, so I, I think the contemporary uh, perceptions are kind of mixed because, um, you know, there are people and I was looking at this, uh, particularly because I was looking at that Thomasite, um, the centennial, right? Uh, I was looking at that and, you know, um, reaction to the centennial and uh, you know, they're, they're mixed kind of legacies. And, and Judy Ake, I don't know whether she is, um, you know, Mary Rasless worked with Judy Ake on Bearers of Benevolence. Um, you know, Judy Ake talked about uh, going around after that um, centennial to audiences, and they were very mixed. Some of them thought that the um, American educators were, um, you know, God's gift, they had come to help help Filipinos. And, and many of them like uh, were like Renato Constantino, complete miseducation, right? And so I think that there's a real uh, kind of mixture. And that was evident in the conference. I read the conference proceedings, um, the conference that took place in 2001 on the Thomasite legacy. Right. Um, there, there were a lot of critiques, but there was, you know, some people, but I, I don't think there was anybody who sort of celebrated this, this homage to the uh, mm -hmm. Dharma sites, even even news articles. I've looked at some newspapers um, which, you know, had glowing, you know, photographs and all of, of students and Dharma sites. Um, you know, they acknowledged that uh, they had come as part of, you know, an, an imperial mission. I mean, that was you know, not, not to be uh, discounted. So uh, the contemporary reception, um, well, it goes a different ways. Uh, I, I have to ask you people, what I was looking at recently was Duarte's quincentennial, what is it, quincentennial celebration that he's having right now, which um, you all must be um, part of, uh, or not part of, but at least aware of. And I don't know what, what you think of that, but, so you, and I, I looked at a lot of uh, it's all all online, right? Um, and so I was looking at that, and um, so you know, obviously Duarte, on one level, you can say he, he's my post-colonial buddy, but no, I mean <laughs> he wants to he wants to write a Filipino-centric history and a post-colonial history. Is using all the right terms to show the essential unity and nationalism of the Philippines. I mean, we're going down a really dangerous road here, right? So in terms of uh, the the most, I guess, uh, ghastly use or, or critique of the uh, American education, I think that's one. And I, I'm, I hope I haven't made any political faux pas in my, in my comments here that you will need to erase from this live stream. Um, there's, a, there's another question, um, this time about, um, would you have early studies of how education was weaponized in Iraq and Afghanistan? Would you have early studies? I don't understand what early studies... Perhaps in your, perhaps um, from earlier research you've done, perhaps? You mean with, uh, is this in relation to the American, um, is this in relation to the American invasions of uh, Iraq and Afghanistan? Right, yes, yes, yes. And, but my, my yeah, um, perhaps one way of, of looking at that question is I, I'm interested to find out how your work might address, uh, for example, the US troops pull out it from Afghanistan um, recently, the interest in that, and how would your how would your work address that now? Oh my gosh, the interest um, in that. Yeah, 
So, I mean, there's so many different levels, and I think Elena must be uh, with me thinking of the gender questions all along, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Because one of the big things that um, um, has been there with, with with the questions in terms of um, Afghanistan, you know, the moment um, they decided to have the complete pull of, oh my God, mm -hmm. what's going to happen to the women now that we have left? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the, the women are going to suffer because, because we've left. But, uh, you know, mm -hmm. ev everybody knows that the, uh, you know, even the invasion of Afghanistan was, um, supported by Barbara Bush, who, you know, gave the, the address of, um, you know, she addressed the nation, you know, the president addresses the nation, Barbara Bush addressed the nation during, you know, November 2020, um, sorry, 2001, um, mm. saying here, you know, because of us, because of the American troops, Afghan women are so free, right? Uh, and so what, what you see over here is, Sort of that same, you know, rhetoric of you know saving women and so on. Um, Almira, if you can put up, I just pulled up something. I I thought I would mention this. Um, Almira, I think image number five. If she can put up, uh, I'm going to tell her to show you um, uh, after this. Uh, the next one, please. Yes, so this is an image that um, this um, there's this association called the Revolutionary Association of Women of Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. um, it has been around since the 1970s. And I just mentioned this history. Many of you might know about it. And I apologize if I'm just repeating stuff everybody knows. Um, but it, it has never occurred to a lot of feminist organization, including the feminist majority in the U.S., to, you know, keep something like Rawa um, in mind and see what uh, they want. Um, this uh, organization has never supported the U.S. invasion of Afghanistan, has never supported their coming and, and, and liberating them. And this is a cartoon that they just put up on their website. If you can go to rawa.org. Uh, R-A-W-A dot org, they put that up. So 20, 2001, 2021, right? Mm -hmm. So you can pretty much see where they stand. They are not, you know, it's not the US narrative of the burqa clad woman in 2001. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, later in 2001, now I see the face of an Afghan woman. They said, you know, we, we have got uh, lots of problems that, um, you know, were exacerbated by American rule, including, um, you know, our children getting killed, our houses getting bombed, our electricity being cut off, um, random drone strikes, you know, not being able to eat. I mean, you know, eating, women eat, right? Uh, women live in homes. Uh, women have to uh, look after their children. So when bourgeois white feminists imagine that they can talk about feminism as though there was sort of a universal feminism that, you know, does not have to be connected to questions of class or empire and all that. They are um, putting out a, a notion of privileged feminism. And, and I think this relates to, um, and, and uh, this was not a major part of my study, but uh, it certainly relates to the way that the Japanese official, uh, officials in Japan um, uh, thought about Japanese women when they were occupying. And uh, there's a scholar by the name of uh, Lisa Yoneyama, who Elena might well know, who's done very good work on this, um, and who's talked about how, um, you know, the um, occupation uh, forces, um, you know, their vision of the women they were liberating was a constructed one of these, you know, centuries of suffer uh, suffering Japanese women. Uh, the women that they did not want to talk to were working women who had formed unions, who uh, were quite vocal. They didn't want to talk to them. They didn't want to consult them. They wanted to talk to middle class women, you know, of a certain kind who could be molded into their idea of bourgeois domesticity so they could talk about that. And in fact, um, she talks also about how um, they were pre-occupation images of some of Japanese women were that 
they were part of the empire which many of them were and they were very mm-hmm. militant and they were overly strong then suddenly when the occupation comes then there's this you know this quiet japanese woman who has to just sit quietly behind her husband and giggle behind her hand you know and then the americans come and then they um you know liberate this woman now it's true that japanese you know the constitution that was written after americans came you know gave you know rights to women and so on um but it just neglects a whole bunch of these women who had actually been and you know so many of the women in japan anyway and it, elena knows much more about this so i feel um please correct me if i'm uh, if i'm wrong um there was because of the uh, you know the 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 uh, war time um, you know economic uh, exigencies there were so many women in japan who had to work right mm-hmm. they had to work to support their families so this idea of this japanese woman who kind of stayed at home and you know looked after this patriarchal husband was actually patently false but it was an image that was very useful to have in terms of this idea of we've come to japan and we've liberated this woman and then this woman goes to the school she's on the arms of her white you know uh, american husband or you know gi lover or whatever and now she is you know got into full grown uh individualistic feminism right mm-hmm. so i think i do see you know the the kind of connection there but um i mean rava has made it abundantly clear how um in lot of their writings and I, i've written about this elsewhere actually in a long article in genders about um you know how um they uh, they were extremely upset at the way in which uh a lot of feminists had treated their organization you know at the same time as because they needed funds from uh whatever friends they had that they had to accede to some of the demands um of um uh, of these women so yeah and there's there's a really interesting i'm going off topic here but if anybody reads the vagina monologues please read under the burqa from mm-hmm. vagina monologues which is all, all, always you know people always stage it at uh, um, at um, uh, on women's day right mm-hmm. uh, but but do take a look at the section which he added under the burqa and that just once again repeats imperial feminism with with a big bang yeah. we have one we last question from the from the um, audience uh, malini if that's all right uh, from the nashri uh, torat could you speak more about how these school curriculums were designed in us occupied philippines were they made by government agencies private or religious institutions or a combination of these and was there an approved process for textbooks or other materials okay in one minute <laughs> uh in one minute the 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 whole um curriculum was extremely centralized um so there was a, a central body uh the, it was not religious institutions there were not private institutions uh it was um a a centralized body uh, hierarchically structured with uh the director of education and but they had to work with filipinos right i mean this is a small force working with, with a huge bunch of people but you know even the uh the uh, the superintendents of education in provinces were americans till 1915 um camilo osius was the first superintendent of education so like you have 15 years where so there's a there's the um the, the overall director of education the superintendents of education those are all american then they consult with um you know these uh, their filipino educators and they come up with a curriculum that has to be followed in in all the schools their required texts their recommended texts and so on uh and the others and there's there's a process that they go through uh they confer and they come up with this uh list and that 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 thing changed sometimes it was for five year periods and some of the texts are for two and three year periods but a five year period seems to be what is um generally done but that's a long question thank you okay thank you thank you malini so um we've we've gone over an hour of this very uh, compelling and 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 wonderful discussion on on uh, Malini's book um if the, we can have a few words from first elena and then marbi about about the book or the topic once again before we wrap up 
please go ahead. Elena, can we can we start with you? Yeah. Again, thank you, Melanie, for the for this chance to 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 read this wonderful new book. It's been really really exciting to hear you engage with all of our questions. I just want to close with a comment. Um, your your project dealing with U.S. empire in education and what you connect um, uh, as the way that you talk about the massive violence that is part of colonization or occupation, post-war occupation, that's followed by educational recovery. And um, I'm fascinated by how you paired the Philippines uh, with uh, post-war Japan. And as a historian, I'm always obsessed with origin stories. Where does this begin? And in my own work on uh, mid 19th century, late 19th century uh, Indian wars in the US, uh, I was thinking that um, you raise General Douglas MacArthur's father, Arthur MacArthur, who has this complicated history as a general in the Philippines. And before that, during the Civil War, after the Civil War, he ends up involved in the US Indian Wars and, and the campaign to bring down Geronimo. But I was thinking about MacArthur's connection to uh, through his father, through, through his patrilineal figure, um, fighting Indian wars, um, a violent colonial history that most Americans and most international folks don't know anything about. But the, the Native American boarding schools system begins yeah. in 1960, and it runs till 1978, and the ramifications of that horrid story of the boarding, residential boarding schools continues to unfold through trauma in 2021. And anyway, your book got me thinking about what, um, as you're thinking about M US empire, to look within its borders and to think about 1860, the creation of the Indian boarding schools. There's Haskell, there's Carlisle, and there's a whole series across the United States and then Canada. And the purpose of those schools was to, their, of course, their English language schools was to beat the Indian, to beat the other out of these children, to pacify them, even kill them. But I was thinking that such a violent history and framing around this colonial project of these schools and tutelage. And I, I was just wondering what, you know, another time, another panel, another project. To, I was just wondering what piece in the historical map you've created does that that American chapter fit or offer another way of thinking about what you've mapped out so beautifully in your book? Yeah, I, I mean, that, that that's another huge topic, Elena. I mentioned uh, actually um, uh, briefly in, in my book that uh, many of these educators like Atkins, for instance, visited Carline and Hampton before going to the Philippines. So these were like seen as um, possible, uh, you know, laboratories where uh, the Philippine experiment could be carried out, right? And so uh, there's definitely, and, and there's also, um, you know, people from Carlisle, educators from Carlisle went to the Philippines and vice versa. It's very interesting. Uh, and a Filipino uh, student who actually went to um, Carlisle to be educated, and then later on goes and and sort of becomes uh, becomes Indian in many ways. But yes, this whole project of Indian boarding schools, uh, Filipino schools. I mean, people, you know, saw them and they were going back and forth and and talking about them. I mentioned that briefly. Um, I, I don't know if you are you familiar, but I know we're running out of time. But um, there's a book by Elizabeth Itrium that just came out, and it's called Educating Empire. And she, I, you, I don't know if you're familiar with that, but um, she talks about um, these uh, Indian boarding schools and um, and and the Filipinos a, a, a lot. So uh, I think there definitely uh, is a lot of work, and, and especially because the educators went to those places, right? And they also drew parallels and and talked about industrial education as more appropriate for the Indians, industrial education being more appropriate for Filipinos, and there were all these arguments about industrial education that that were taking place, right? Uh, of course, the boarding school example doesn't doesn't really happen, you know, in, in the Philippines. I mean. People, when high schools are established, they're too far apart. There are very few of them, 
and then people actually have to go and they have to stay with other families in order to attend those schools. So it's not an exact thing, but for sure that that nasty project of killing the uh, killing the Indian, uh, you know, is is uh, uh, certainly a significant one. But yeah, another time, another panel. You know, let's let's work together. Uh, sorry. Go ahead, Marby. Okay, I'll end with just um, congratulating you again, Malini, for this great book, which engages with writing about the colonies and writing from the colonies. Um, I think mm -hmm. it will be a great resource for you know people who are very interested in you know the Philippines, the Philippines, Japan, post-colonial studies, decoloniality, gender studies, as well as those interested um, in more generally in education and literature. So congratulations, buy the book. Thank you, <laughs> thank you, and I, I I really appreciate the Filipino edition because I know the books in the U.S. are so expensive and yeah. I really did want a, a Philippine edition, and I, I'm just so grateful for to Ateneo for for doing this book. So once again, yes, uh, thank you uh, to all our listeners, our viewers um, watching uh, uh, us from everywhere. Um, uh, congratulations once again, Professor Malini Schuler, for uh, your Ateneo University Press edition of Campaigns of Knowledge. Um, friends, uh, we have. Uh, 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 the book on uh, uh, as part of the Manila International uh, Book Fair. Uh, it is on sale uh, uh, here, flash on the screen uh, for the duration of the book fair. And so we hope that you'll um, get a copy. Uh, uh, go to the website, uh, www.manilabookfair.com. It's off at 20% off uh, for today and the duration of, of the book fair. Uh, a number of colleagues have already reserved their copies, Malini, um, um, professing their interest about it. Um, thank you once again to those who have sent in their comments and their questions. I'd like to thank um, Elena and Marby again for participating and, and for um, adding their insights and, and questions and comments um, and for enlivening this discussion. Thank you uh, to the Ateneo University Press, uh, to Almira and uh, um, the, the, the staff and the crew of um, the Ateneo University Press for making this possible. Um, once again, congratulations, Malini. Uh, I know that when I was reading it for my own um, classes for teaching the complexity of learning and teaching English in the Philippines, it, uh, Although I read it with a heavy heart and you know, thinking of all these um, implications in our education system, it's um, very compelling reading. That, that um, thank you so much. In the thank you. System. I really appreciate your comments. Oh, thank you. Thank you once again. So, friends, here we are. I hope uh, that you get the chance to read Malini's book, and we'll see you again in another occasion. Uh, till then, take care, everyone, from wherever you are. Magandang gabi, magandang araw po sa inyo.